In the Middle Ages, you could have been called to war, and you would have been expected to bring your own equipment. Now, you could be the best fighter on the planet, but without good quality armour, you may be killed by the first arrow, axe, or angry snail that crossed your path. So, in this video, we're going to be taking a closer look at some of the different types of medieval armour that were available. So, to help us visualise the differences in armour, we're going to use this cunning scale. From zero at the bottom, all the way up to a hundred at the top. And the first type of armour we're going to look at will be these medieval clothes. Because peasants who weren't able to afford anything better would often have no other choice but to go to battle in literally what they were wearing. Now, it could be argued that this shouldn't really constitute as armour, but it is better than nothing, and it might at least stop you from being stung by nettles. Flimsy fabric tunics are going to be at the bottom of the list. However, they are incredibly cheap because everyone is going to have clothes, unless, well, unless you're really unlucky. So next up is padded armour. Now, padded armour goes by several different names. It's sometimes called a gambeson, or an akiton, a jupon, or a doublet. But what they all have in common is their layers of linen that are stuffed with wool, felt, or horse hair. And it just so happens that I have a gambeson here, so I'm going to get changed into it. And here is the gambeson. It's relatively thick, and certainly soon to be sweaty, and different layers of padding have been stitched into separate sections. The reason why they do this is it's to stop all of the padding bunching up in certain areas. It makes sure that it's evenly spread across the entire piece of clothing. Padded armour is relatively good at stopping percussive blows because of its padded nature. It's also quite resistant to cuts because it's so thick. However, it is let down when it comes to piercing weapons, such as arrows. And if you found yourself wearing just a gambeson on the battlefield, arrows may just be your downfall. So padded armour is going to go here, above peasants' clothing, but nowhere near the top. But have no fear. If you're an acolyte of Akitans, a groupie of gambesons, or you just like padded armour, because all of the other armours require padded armour underneath for them to work properly. Which brings us to our next armour. Mail. I'm sure you're often asked, what's better than padded armour? To which you can give the response, padded armour but covered in 40,000 metal links, otherwise known as mail. Mail armour isn't the most flattering or fashionable, despite the brass edging, but it is incredibly protective. One of the reasons mail armour is so protective is because it's made up of thousands upon thousands of metal links, which also makes it quite heavy, weighing anything between 12 to 20 kilos. But medieval soldiers knew how to accessorise. They would often wear a belt around their waist to help support the weight of their armour onto their hips rather than just their shoulders, much like a modern hiking backpack. Mail armour was extremely popular in the early Middle Ages with anyone who could afford it. However, it wasn't long until weapon design caught up and found holes in the defence of mail armour, quite literally in the case of the long bodkin arrow, which was designed to slip between the links and straight into the soldier underneath. Mail armour is certainly an improvement on the padded armour underneath, so let's pop it up halfway. Even despite weapons being invented to counter mail armour, it still remained popular throughout the Middle Ages, especially with those who couldn't afford anything better. But from the 14th century, a new style of armour emerged. And that new armour was brigandine. The brigandine is made of several interconnected metal plates which join together to create a hard shell which protect the wearer. 
The solid metal plates, which protected the wearer from attack, were cleverly riveted to a fabric front, which allowed them to move freely. And for a short time, brigandine was worn over the top of male armour, which made it incredibly heavy. It also wasn't long until people realised that an attack which had the power to penetrate through brigandine would easily penetrate the male underneath, rendering the male essentially obsolete. Soon after this realisation, male armour wasn't worn under brigandine. Instead, it was used in places that were unsuitable for plate armour, such as joints, armpits, and sometimes even worn as a nappy to protect the wearer's, well, you know what I mean. Brigandine was certainly an improvement on male armour, but it still relied on male armour to be used in the places where plate couldn't fit. So we're going to put it a little higher than male armour on our scale. And during the 15th century, full plate armour had been introduced, expertly crafted to protect the wearer from head to toe in full plate steel. Now sadly, I don't have any of that armour kicking around, so through movie magic, we're going to bring you the next best thing. Oh. Unsurprisingly, being fully encased in armour was incredibly protective. And because suits of armour were tailor-made to fit the wearer, they could move freely while wearing it. The whole story about knights being stuck on their back if they ever fell over is a complete myth, and frankly, an insult to the craftsmanship of the time. So if plate armour was so protective, why wasn't everybody wearing it? Well, it's quite simple. It would have cost a lot of money to buy, and it would have only been affordable to the richest people in the country. So plate armour is going to rightfully go at the top of our scale, but it would have been incredibly expensive. There are plenty more styles and variations of armour that would fit somewhere on this scale. But for now, that's all we have time for. As always, if you have any questions or suggestions, leave them down in the comments section below. And until next time, take care.